record for Cafe Connections. So what a great way to start the year. Um, we are recording today as well, so hopefully everyone's okay with that, but we will share it internally as well for those that, that couldn't make it. So good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm Alicia Lloyd. Uh, Linda was unable to be here in person today, and when we were able to get Usman to actually come in, it was a great opportunity for someone to be here in person to actually interview. So guess what? I'm it. A um, little bit of housekeeping first. We'll have 50 minutes here today with, with Usman and then we'll ensure we leave some time at the end for some Q&As. Um, and then for about 10 minutes or so, he'll be happy to stay around to take some more photos for those that haven't and sign T-shirts, etc. cetera, um, if you'd like that as well. Um, please share them and make sure you tag us um, and also on Workplace as well, flood it. Um, and if you haven't joined our Workplace group, please join Brisbane Heat. Um, there'll also be some bats handed out for those people online as well. Dan and Darcy will be in touch with you guys around who has um, got those. Um, we'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. Before I introduce our special guest here, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we gather today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and acknowledge the important role that they play within our communities. All right. Now, Usman, indulge me for a minute. I am going to just rattle off your Wikipedia bio. And for those who may not know the full extent of your legendary status. You've got to be, you've got to be careful with Wikipedia. Is this on? Yep, it's on. I once had a teammate, uh, Mark Cameron, who played with us, and he had the smallest head in the world. And I used to make fun of him all the time. And I actually went on the Wikipedia page and wrote up this bizarre <laughs> story about why his head was so small. It was on there for two years. Two years it was on there. It was fake news. So... <laughs> Take you with a grain of salt. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, feel free to interject if anything is incorrect. But let me read it. It's quite long, everyone. So, born in Pakistan, Usman made his first uh, was became the first Muslim to play for Australian when he made his debut back in the 2011 Sydney Test. With his international career having stalled slightly following the much hyped debut, Kawaja decided to move from New South Wales to beautiful sunny Queensland at the start of 2012-2013. Uh, uh, season is the opening batter for Australia and has played more than 100 international matches, including 56 tests, and has a higher average than the legends of the game like Adam Gilchrist, David Warner, Justin Langer, Michael Slater, Ian Chappell, and Mark Wall. How am I going? That can always change, but yes, you're right. <laughs> Kawaja played a huge role in Sydney, Sydney Thunder's title conquest. It's okay, we'll forgive you for playing for them. <laughs> um, with two unbeaten centuries in the fifth edition of the Big Bash League. Fans may also remember your gritty century against Pakistan played in Dubai in 2018, an innings which saved the game for Australia. You sealed your spot in the 2019 World Cup squad following two stylish ODI centuries during your India and UAE tours and most recently scored 195 not out in the recent test against South Africa. Apparently you are now called King Uzi. Uh, if you say so. <laughs> I normally refer to myself as the people's champ. So people's champ. I'll take, I'll this, take either. Well, Wikipedia says it, so <laughs> there you go. That sounds good to me. Someone's obviously <laughs> gone in there and edited it. Um, you're a husband to gorgeous wife, Rachel, and dad to Isla, who's eight months old, and Aisha, who is two and a half years old. And you've recently signed a four-year deal with the Brisbane Heat as captain of our gorgeous team. Anything else you'd like to add there? Round of applause for uh, Osman. Anything else you want to add there? Wikipedia okay. was pretty good there. Yeah. Respect. Respect. Part King Uzi, but you know, yep. Well done. Okay, cool. Let's get into the questions. So as a business, we are doing a lot of work around our values and how we show up every day. Um, our four values, which everyone in the room here will absolutely know, are being customer obsessed, having a growth mindset, being genuine and achieving impact. So when I was preparing for the session today, I was doing a little desktop research and I found some really strong alignment to you um, as a person to, to our corporate values. So just um, give me a sec while I kind of um, debrief on what, what I found and you can talk, talk to me about whether that's a fair assessment. Sounds good. You aren't afraid to speak up. You're known for your direct truthful feedback, particularly to the coach of the Australian cricket team. You are very resilient, having been in and out of the Australian cricket team and right now you're at the height of your career. And you're very calm under pressure. Being an opening batsman is a really tough role and you enjoy a bit of dabbing and a bit of dance moves on the field. So is that a fair assessment? What do you think? That is, that was a lot, that was a lot in there, I reckon. There's about four things. What, so what was the first one? You first said, one was around, you aren't afraid to speak up. Yeah, look, I know, 
I think initially when I was making my way into the Australian cricket team or New South Wales, you are, you don't speak up. It's, um, I came from the old school environment, especially in cricket where, you know, Adam Dale back there will tell you where you only spoke when you were spoken to. Um, and if you did speak up, uh, you, yeah, it wasn't a good thing. The old boys would absolutely nail you. And for myself too, um, you know, being from Pakistan, uh, being, you know, colored skin coming into, um, I mean, all the teams I played, they were just very, they were very white. So I'm going to be really playing them, you know, just basically, I'm just going to say it, they were very white. So that's just where cricket has been for a very long time. And all my friends in cricket were all white. So growing up, I just had all white friends and, um, coming up through there, I never really felt like I could be myself coming up because I always felt like I want to fit in. Right. We, we all do. When we're young, going to school, high school, we always want to fit in. So, you know, I try to dress like everyone else. Um, I try to be like everyone else. And I played for New South Wales until I was about 24. I debuted for Australia, played for Australia. But even the Australian cricket team, I wanted to fit in. I didn't drink, um, which is a big part of Australian cricket culture, particularly back then. So for me, it always felt like I was a bit detached, whether it was from the captain or the coaches. I wasn't involved in those conversations behind the scenes that they were having in the bars and the pubs late at night because I just I wasn't there. So for my first nine games in Australia, playing for Australia, I actually really hated it. I didn't enjoy it at all um, for the fact that I just – one, I didn't score runs. I didn't feel like I really belonged. I didn't really feel like anyone had my back at that time. But two, I just – I didn't feel like I was a part of the team. And it's disappointing to look back on now um, and see that. And I'm very vocal about that now because I don't want another Usman Khawaja, you know, boy or girl coming from a different background feeling that way because um, it wasn't nice. And I remember I finished that thinking, uh, I don't want to play for – I genuinely thought I didn't want to play for Australia again. I, like that. I didn't really enjoy that. How about, you know, i, I got to find happiness somewhere else so that was the same time i moved up to this beautiful state queensland I, I needed a change so i moved up um played for the queensland bulls and it was that point in time where i just thought you know i've tried to be this other guy for a long time um you know it might have an effect on my game might not but i'm moving up to queensland i've got a clean slate i don't know these teammates they don't really know me i'm just going to be myself here and genuinely going to be myself and Look, I copped a bit of stick for it. Um, if I'm being totally honest, Queensland, when I moved up, was about felt like I was about 20 years behind Sydney uh, in a lot of things. Um, but multiculturalism was probably one of them. Uh, but that didn't deter me. I said, no, look, I'm going to be myself. I'm going to dress the way I want. I'm going to do these things. And funnily enough, when I did that, look, I played some really good cricket over the next couple of years. But I also earned a lot of respect from my teammates. They knew who I was. You know, they, this is Uzi. He's, he's straight down the line, he's a straight shooter. He is who he is. What you see is what you get. And that actually, you know, that that respect I earned from them eventually made me realize, hey, wait a minute. People actually respect you a lot more when you're being yourself. Whether that's, you know, whether you fit or conform or whether you don't, they know what they see is what you get. And I think that confidence when I saw that, allowed me to speak my mind and to be myself and and say look as long as i'm respectful you know as long as i'm you know being respectful to the teams the environment i'm in to people i'm talking to i will be honest i will speak my mind and when i started doing that on top of what i was doing in terms of you know just being myself it changed everything because people then you know they just knew they just knew who i was and my friends now even uh, matthew renshaw to an extent uh you, who I got pretty close with, he knows that I'm the kind of guy that you can, the one big thing for me is to take me on my word. And he, he uses it against me sometimes because he knows I won't lie to him. So I have to like, kind of like speak around the truth to him. <laughs> I don't want to answer his question, but I think that's a really important part of who I am. And, and that's why I want to tell you the backstory because that's where it kind of stemmed from. So that was, yeah, to the first little bit, that was the answer. Absolutely, absolutely. And being resilient as well, you know, like you've been in and out of the team and obviously you've taken some knocks, but then you get back into the team. How do you back up time and time again? You know, how do you get over the one bad game you played to then back up the next day? And what are some tools that, you know, everyone in the crowd here can, can kind of take away? Um, like cricket's built on failures. It's a bit like life. 
Uh, you fail more times than you succeed, unfortunately. It sucks. Um, then you have a couple of good games and you win games for your team and it's good, but you know that there's always going to be – especially as a batsman, you get one chance, you're out. So, I mean, I actually find cricket is a great leveler, just like life. You know, things can be going well, you're on top of the world, and then something just happens and you can turn your life upside down. Same thing happens in cricket. You're on top of the world. You think you're King, King Uzi or King Kawaji, whatever the Wikipedia said. Um and then things change and suddenly you become from hero to villain just like that. Um, I've been dropped out of the Australian team so much. Um, you know, I've had things outside of cricket um, that have really, you know, challenged me and tested me. I guess the biggest learnings from me throughout my career, for me to perform on the field, yes, I need to do a lot of hard work to be able to execute my skills, but I also need to be happy off the field. Um, and that's equally, if not more important, because every time I've struggled off the field, haven't found balance off the field. I've really struggled to perform, you know, on the field or work environment for you guys. Um, I'm sure some of you guys see a lot of head nodding. It's very similar. We all go through really similar things in life. People just see us. They see us, the cricketers up there, but we're as human as anyone. And I'm getting emotional here talking about because I can think about all the things that I've recollected in my head to get to where I am now. And the three things that have helped me in life, and this is my personal, and it's different for everyone else, but things, three things that have really helped me in life. Are one, uh, the biggest one is probably gratitude. You know, you're going through such so many ups and downs in life and in cricket. I think we forget how lucky in a lot of things we are in Australia. And me traveling the world, and I had this conversation with Paul, funnily enough, the other night, that you travel around the world and you see how lucky we are in Australia. And you don't realize it until you actually go out. And I... I came from, you know, family which came to Australia, didn't really have too much. Um, we lived in low sexual economic places. It was tough life. I, I, I shared a room with my brother till I was 18. Um, it, it was, we lived really cramped. There was, there was lots of things. And, you know, when you talk about resilience and whatnot, at some level you need to have a level of contentment to say, all right, shit's hit the fan, things aren't going well. You need to look back and like look at all the great things you do have in life. Like I walk around most morning, most days, I walk around just I'm religious, so I believe in God. So I'm just walking around every step. I, I'll do it for two minutes at a time. Say thank you God, thank you God, thank you God. I'll say in Arabic because Islam's all in Arabic, so I'll say it. But I'm just saying it for the smallest of things that I have the ability for myself that I can walk to the shops. I can walk and play with my daughter because I love sports. A lot of times, not I would never say, you know, not being able to walk gives you a lesser life or anyone handicapped. Not saying that. I'm just saying a lot of things I love to do in life require me to run, walk, cricket. I couldn't play cricket for Australia if I couldn't walk. So the smallest of those things I'm grateful for. And that really puts life into perspective when, yeah, shit hits the fan, for me in particular. And it's something I have to do over and over again, that form of gratitude. I guess the two other things I'm really mindful of is mindfulness um, a lot of people talk about it, but a lot of anxiety in cricket and sport that you don't see when you're here, maybe it might be deadlines for you guys, you know, you need to hit certain things, certain KPIs, whatever it may be. Anxiety comes from the future and mindfulness for me is just about being present and what I'm doing right now. Controlling the controllables is a cliche, but it's one of the most important things that I've found in my, in my life in cricket and outside of cricket. Cause there's certain things like you cannot control. You can't control when, you know, your parents might pass away. You know, it's, it's a horrible thing to think about, but you just can't control those things. You can't control someone gets in a car crash. You can't control um, weather, 195, not out. I can't control that. Um, so you have to, at some level, understand that what can I control? Because if I can take care of the things I can control, ultimately, that will give me the best chance to succeed. So when you talk about resilience again, and I'm talking about getting dropped from the Australian cricket team, when I got dropped from the 2019 Ashes, I genuinely thought that was my last time I'll ever play for Australia. So what kicked in for me and what I think helped me achieve to get back in Australia was number one, gratitude. I thought, how many games have I played? I played 44 matches for Australia. That's 44 matches than I ever thought I'd ever play. And how many hundreds have I scored for? I scored eight hundreds at that time for Australia. Eight hundreds than I'd ever thought I'd score for Australia. So for me, then I had, I had a new, um, I had a new daughter. I was going to say new daughter. I had a, my, Aisha was born. And for me, it was just like, Thank God. I'm so grateful. I've had a great career. I'm very happy. That was the first tick. Second tick was, what am I trying to do right now? Well, the process is really important to me. I love playing cricket. I'm going to be the best cricketer for Queensland. And at that time, Sydney Thunder, whoever I was playing for that I could be. 
And I put those things in steps and I started scoring runs again and lots of runs. And I wasn't trying to play for Australia again. The fact that I was trying to control the process and everything I was con- trying to control and have that gratitude led me back to be able to play for Australia. I think if I if I tried too hard, actually Ricky Ponting told me, Ricky Ponting's a great Australian cricketer. He always told me one thing that I've always remembered. He said, the harder you try, the worse it gets. And that's all about being outcome focused in my mind. So the harder you try to get 100, the less likely you are to get 100. I can promise you, I've gone out there, I'm going to get 100 today. And I've never ever got 100 when I've thought that way. Because you forget about what it takes to get to that point, little steps and little steps. It takes a long time to get 100. So that gratitude and being able to be, you know, mindful and just accepting what will be will be and staying in the moment. They're the reasons I ended up actually having an opportunity to represent Australia again. And when I did get an opportunity to represent Australia again, I was not thinking I'm going to go out there and score runs. I was just thinking I'm going to stay in this moment. I am going to enjoy this last, because probably could be my last test match at the SCG. And I'm just really going to enjoy this for what it is. 45 test match, I played 44. 45 test match is still pretty good. And funnily enough, I concentrated on the process and gave myself the best opportunity to score runs. And I did score runs. Um, so back to back hundreds, which I was never expecting in my wildest dreams. Not to say that this is a, you know, this is a secret to success, but to give yourself the best chance to be resilient, get knocked down, keep coming, knocked down, keep getting back up. These are the two things that really helped me in my life. Great answer. I think that answers the calm under pressure um, observation I made earlier on as well. So, a, a little, a, a bit little dancing, bit, yeah, a little, a little bit. Dabbing. The calm under pressure is probably my third one, which I don't talk as much because I understand everyone's very different. Um, I'm religious. Uh, I believe in God. I believe in destiny to some respect. So I try to, I accept what will be, will be in my head. I still believe we have choice. If you want me to delve in this later, I can, it gets complicated. I believe in choice. Don't worry, but I also believe in fate. It can be a complicated topic to understand, but that for me, that is very important. What will be, will be, you have your own journey. You make your own choices. I don't believe in sliding doors. Um, that helps me to be calm under pressure because I accept things for what, even the other night with Brisbane heat, we got right down to the very wire and I was, part of me was shitting myself because I really wanted to win. Right. I like, I, I'm competitive, like, you know, competitors, we want to win. But at the same time, if you see me sitting on the sideline up until the point we win, I'll normally try to just keep telling myself to calm down. Cause I'm like, whatever meant to happen will happen. You can't control anything now. Just sit down and watch. So that's probably the calmness piece. The last bit. Absolutely. I think then you had a bit of a dance afterwards though, didn't you? I, I don't know. I'm always dancing. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, we talk about growth um, in our business a lot, growth growth of the business and growth as individuals. And that comes from being brave and emba- embracing learning. We've got learning week coming up, bit of a plug in two weeks time. Um, so that's um, a bit like O week without the toga parties, basically. So um, uh, we... So it's not O week. Well, not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you talk to us about growth as an individual and perhaps some reflections on how you would have approached something a little differently? Um, yeah, no, there's no truer saying that everything that grows is destined to change and the world's always changing. So if you're not growing, you're not keeping up with the world. It's very similar in cricket. Um, I obviously related back to cricket, but you can be doing something like the way I was batting five years ago is not the way I'm batting now. One, yes, I've learned, I've, I've learned from mistakes. I've gotten better in my mind, I've gotten better, but I also realized that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, especially in cricket, people will realize what you're doing and then they'll find ways to find ways to combat that. So if you're not growing to combat what they're trying to do, then you're pretty much leaving yourself for failure. And it took me a while to realize when 10 years ago, I was like, Oh no, I've been successful the last two years doing this. So I'll just copy and paste. And it's one of those things that the growth mindset is so important in sport, but also think it's important in life because life is always changing. Like we talked about earlier, your old offices that you were at, um, you know, talking about, you know, how old school it was and the things you had to do. And, and I laughed, joked about when I first came to Queensland that they still made me fill out like paper for my licenses. And I thought, Jesus, what, what, what 19th century have we come to? You know, get a quill out and start, because in Sydney it was all electronic, right? So even then I'm thinking, man, this is far behind. So the world keeps evolving just like cricket and cricket, everything keeps evolving. So I have to keep evolving with the times because how I'm playing now 
the game will be played much better in 10 years' time. They'll be better than us. And I'm and I'm smart enough not to know that. Uh, I don't really like it when the old cricketers go, oh, back in my day. Yeah, back in your day, the game wasn't as good, I promise you. That's not. I've seen you play. It wasn't as good. <laughs> But that's not a. I still. It's not a bad thing. I respect them because you can only be as good as your era, right? But the game is always going to evolve and change. So in ten years' time, the game's going to be much better. If you're not keeping up with that change, you're going to get found out. So for me, I learned. It took me a little while, and I learned probably five years ago that if I'm not reflecting, looking back, and looking at ways to improve, the game will go past me. Um, and I think the same thing holds um, for work life, particularly you you guys because technology seems to be changing at an exponential rate these days from where it was 10 20 30 years ago it's amazing to see what's happening every year now so yeah a big part of my life in terms of cricket has been having that growth mindset because when you get old look i'm I'm, in cricketing terms i'm old so for me i can be a bit stubborn at times too i've done this way before i've done that and i think a lot of that held me back particularly when i got dropped in 2019 I wasn't playing as well as I wanted to, as I should have been. And it actually took me getting dropped from Australia um, to some extent to reflect and look back and realize that, "Mm, okay, I need to change a couple of things here or else, you know, I'm not going to get the best out of myself. And it can be very tough. The longer you're playing the game, the longer you're in industry, the more knowledge you get, you kind of think you know it all and you kind of know, and you do, you have experience. Experience, you cannot buy that off a shelf. There's no, no true statement said. But that's what I love about having young guys in my team. Um, they keep you going and, and they, they, they definitely keep, you know, someone like, you know, Manus who's ADHD nonstop going. You know, I love, I love being around him because he keeps me going. He, might, he may actually someone like that, that it's an infectious personality and you want to be better because of it. So it doesn't matter how old you are. And even now at 35, I'm still going in the nets trying to get better. And I'm only have, you know, four, five years max left in me, but I'm going to make sure that hopefully by the end of the time, I can be the best version of myself. That's amazing. I think I read something on LinkedIn the other day that as a leader, the one thing that's going to change exponentially and the thing you need to stay ahead of the curve of is technology. Like, you know, your slacks, your jeers, all that sort of thing. You can't just leave it to people in your team to understand that you need to be across it as well. So it'd be the same with you. I've been cricket like, and now everyone sees everything. You can't hide anything. You could hide stuff back in the day because it wasn't as much footage and you can sneak away. Now you cannot hide at all. And that's all because of technology. Every game it's viewed every game is on the internet, so definitely. Everyone's got a comment like on social media. Yeah, that 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 is another that is another bag of its own. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put my co-chair of our gender balance um, hat on now. It's an employee resource group we've got here. If you're not involved, follow us on Workplace. Um, I'm keen to ask you one question before we go to the Q and A's, just around diversity and inclusion. Um, you were quoted on Friday in the SMH around um, that you didn't support the Australian cricket team for a long time up until you were 13, 14. Um, I could just not relate to the Australian cricket team. Can you talk to me a little bit around, you know, your passion for multiculturalism, diversity and inclusion? And as a kid moving from Pakistan to Australia, like you know, we've seen the best and worst of it. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I guess from my personal experience, it's mostly been around uh, inclusivity, particularly anti-racism. Um, coming up from my background, now that I've got two daughters, uh, it gives you a lot more perspective. Gender equality is definitely up there. Um, you know, the world's changed, cricket is changing, um, and I and I love where, where it's heading at the moment, especially cricket as an organisation. But we'll talk about, I guess, from my experiences growing up. Um, as I said earlier, I just – Cricket Australia has for a long time, 15 years now, put a lot of money, a lot of money into multiculturalism and grassroots cricket and getting players, both female and men, from, you know, I guess ethnic backgrounds. And you look at the Australian cricket team and it is just white face the whole time. And I went through my whole career and it, was, and it sucked because when I was young – the guys, and it was, as I mentioned earlier, all the cricketers were white. So they look at the West Indian cricket team. The West Indian cricket team, you know, they're laid back. They're cool. They're doing their thing. And straight away, the guys would be like, oh, no, nah, you know, these guys, are, they're effing lazy. Like, they're not trying. They, they don't care. They, I mean, what do you mean they? Like, first of all, what do you mean? How, how do you segregate? How do you, how do you put a whole um, race into one 
umbrella? Like, how do you stereotype them? And it just didn't really, when I was young, the same thing. Uzi's from Pakistan. Pakistanis are lazy. They don't like to, you know, I was never, unfortunately, I've never had great genes in terms of running. Like I've never been a great long distance runner. Um, I've had to work hard um, my whole life on what I eat. I have to be very disciplined. You know, I wish I had my wife's metabolism, Rachel. She's got, she's got, you know, great. And she just eats, she just eats the worst things in the world. Honestly, I'm so jealous of her. Um, I've never gotten away from that. So when I was younger and I struggled a little with keeping my weight off or, you know, I wasn't the greatest runner. They'd be like, oh, he's lazy. He doesn't try hard enough. Without actually getting to know me as a person or where, you know, what I was trying to achieve. I have all these stereotypes thrown at me and I go through life with very, very different upbringings. Like I came from a Pakistani, like a subcontinent background because Indian, Pakistan, Sri Lankan, the culture is very similar and they experience the same things. And, um, you know, I, I had a lot of trouble growing up with terms of, you know, I, I had a girlfriend, Oh, big trouble. Girlfriends are no, no. <laughs> and my mom and dad were not happy. Even the, you know, I, had, I had more than one girlfriend, but that first girlfriend, I remember, it was, it was just like, my mom didn't talk to me for six months. Can you imagine that? Your mom doesn't talk to you. Like, she talked to me, but she didn't really. She, and my mom I was a mama's boy growing up too. So this was like, and then one of the things in life that, that really affected my cricket because I really struggled. My parents, I felt like my parents didn't like, like me or I didn't feel supported. But at the time, I had no support in the Australian cricket because I spent most of my time with the with the New South Wales cricket team, right? Just like you guys would spend a lot of time at work. You end up spending more time at work than a lot of cases than you do at home just for the, the beast that it is. So I didn't have that support really growing up because people didn't understand what was going through my life. They didn't understand the culture. They didn't understand what was happening. People were like, that's, that's really weird. And I, and I get it. I, I understand it's not very like Australian culture at all. But when I see that, I realized why people, because at that point, that could have been a tipping point. I stopped scoring runs for about six months. And at that time, I actually thought I'm, I might give the game away here. It's getting too hard. I can't score. And I, and I almost did. So it's like those small things where if I had someone who was a coach from a similar background, he could actually relate to me and, and talk to me. But all the coaches in Australia and even high performance levels are all white too. So what I'm trying to get at with Cricket Australia is, and the reason I spoke up before, I was like, we need to change this not only from the grassroots level, but more so the high performance level because the people at the top, the people who make the decisions and the people which the game flows down to, they're all white Anglo-Saxon Australians. And if that's going to happen, you're going to really struggle to see multicultural ethnic players, both male and female, come through the system because it's very hard to understand. You know, you need to give them a lot of support. I could not be here without a lot of support. My family... My teammates, coaches, selectors, they have to support you to get to the very top. You can't do anything on your own. So for me, it's not about, you know, we throw a lot of money in grassroots level. So I'm trying to shake it up. I'm trying to get Cricket Australia to actually learn from my experiences. I talk about subconscious bias when it comes to selecting teams. And um, I see it when, um, you know, a CEO selects the coaches for teams. I've seen, you know, coaches select their assistant coaches for teams. And it's just a big cycle, mates, choosing mates, people just, and that's, it's going to be very hard for someone from an ethnic background to actually crack it in to high level jobs, um, to high level positions if they don't get the opportunity. So I think that's where I'm trying to really change things for Cricket Australia because it's one thing that they have never done. It's one thing they've never thought about. It's just one thing they've never experienced because they've never had someone in my position who's immigrated from Pakistan, grown up in a very Pakistani culture with my family, come up through the Australian system and play cricket for Australia. So I think any information I can give on my journey I actually think that's the biggest legacy. I can actually leave this game more than any games I play, more than any runs I score. So if I can make it a little bit easier and hopefully have that representation as the Australian cricket team in 10 years' time, if we can see a couple more coloured cricketers, cricketers from different backgrounds in the Australian cricket team, I mean, that'd be great. Because if you walk down the street and you look at how multicultural Australia is and then you look at our Australian cricket team, you're like, something's not fitting right there. So... From my point of view, that's why I'm trying to do this because I just think um, if it's not me, then then who is? On you, I know you're doing a lot of work with um, Queensland cricket in particular around all of that as well. So yeah, yeah, that's that's um, great to hear. Um, we might open up to some questions. I'm sure there's some burning questions. Um, 
Darcy's going to walk around with a microphone for those in the room. So just pop your hand up. And for those online, just pop it in the chat and Dan will, um, I'll throw to Dan at some point as well. So first question, Nicole. Nick and Michael, the first two hands to go up. Here you go. Um, before I actually ask my question, are you succeeding? Do you feel like you're getting traction according to with, with respect to Alicia's previous question? Very slowly. It's going to be a slow burn. As I always say, this could take 10, 15, 20 years because it's very hard to change organisations. Um, it's very hard to change traditions. It's very hard. Yeah, when people are already embedded in roles, it can be very difficult. So I'm a realist. It's not going to happen quickly, but maybe if I keep nagging him for a long time, something will happen. Squeaky wheel. Um, actually, my question is around teamwork. So the last kind of six to 12 months or so, we've been having a real focus here around how we break down the silos within the various different departments and work better cross-collaboratively across the organisation as a team. So cricket, my, my daughter plays cricket, and when she started learning, I realised as her parent how difficult each of the various skills and, and the amount of different skills that are required to make a cricketer, let alone a cricket team. So I'm just curious as... Um, I'm just curious, sorry, here's my notes. I'm just curious about any inside insights you can provide around how you've seen teams work well together and what kind of are the key elements that make up a really successful team and any stories you could share around that? Great question, Nick. Very good, very good question. Very complex question. Um, I mean, I've been Queensland captain for 10, 11 years. I think number one, the most important thing in my opinion, is communication. It's funny, uh, I, I've been on both sides, because we're a very ma male, obviously, we're, we're a male cricket team, right? And I've talked to some of the females about the female cricket team. And you guys are a bit more complicated because you have both sexes interacting. Where, you know, guys, we're a male cricket team, we're having blow-ups all the time. We're blowing up at each other all the time, like some of the stuff that goes on. But it's funny, in a male-dominant environment, you just move on. The biggest thing I have seen though in our team in particular is the communication piece because there can be at times what I've tried to put onto the Queensland cricket team is if you want to say something, speak up. And I found in my experience, people really struggle to speak up, really struggle to have tough conversations and open conversations. Um, I always say be open and honest, but be respectful. Um, there was When I first came to the Queensland cricket team, there was a lot of like, I felt like I... You know, yeah, what'd you call it? The Real Housewives of the OC. This is how you got your your daughter's your daughter's name, your son's name. Sorry, um, uh, it was a bit like that. There was a lot of gossiping going on. I was like, well, we need to stop this because it doesn't help anyone if you're um, if you're whinging about things in the background. Nothing is going to get done if you're not happy. If you're not happy with something, just go up to the person, find a way to speak to them. But as leaders in the team, you need to have a relationship where they feel comfortable to come and speak to you. So that's why I've tried my hardest to be really an open and honest with everyone. I've tried my hardest. My word is my is my is is I guess is my thing is my goal. Like for other players, they know if they know Uzi straight down the line. I'm not going to lie to you. Trust what I can say. Come up and speak to me. I have your best interests at heart which I really try to put on the players. Um, so as a leader, I think it's really important to have that communication lines all the way down the bottom. At the end of the day, you're a leader for a reason in a team. You're a leader because you have that experience. You do have that little bit of knowledge, but no leader knows everything. You need your team to function. So even in the field, you'll see Manus coming up to me. You'll see Renshaw. You'll see Jimmy Pearson coming up. You'll see all different people coming up to me and giving me their five cents worth. Now I could just say no shut them off. I need to concentrate, but it's a learned skill. I've learned now how to decipher. Yep. Give me the information. Okay. I agree with you. I'm going to do that. No, sorry. I'm not going to do this, but they feel comfortable enough for me to talk. To. And I think that's a really important piece of the communication. And you know what? You're going to fight. Uh, we, we team, we fight all the time. There's going to be issues. Like we, you spend more, as I said earlier, you spend more time here than you do with your family a lot of times. And what happens when you're with your family, you fight. So when you're around people all the time, you're going to have conflict. You are going to, that's a hundred percent part of being in a team. It's how you handle that conflict and communication. In my opinion, if you can have that conflict and then have the adult conversation as soon as possible to resolve that conflict, then everyone can move forward as quickly as possible. If you don't, and you let that linger, there's going to be communication breakdown. There's going to be productivity breakdown. 
whatever it's not gonna it's not gonna work efficiently so i think that communication piece is the most important did you just tell everyone that i watched the real housewives of the like, sorry, I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oops <laughs> it makes you feel more human she, she, she's she's like everyone else <laughs> worst kept secret leash um, michael did you have a question over here um, hello. You've got two amazing tours coming up with India and then the Ashes. Um, for you personally, which one of those two are you most looking forward to yourself? Um, and can you share with us some of the reasons why? And then which of those two do you think poses like the biggest challenge for Australia overall to win? Yeah, great shirt, by the way. Look, you're looking great. Um, going back to my piece earlier, I don't I've been through so much in cricket and life. I don't actually put any tours, any games on pedestals anymore. Um, every game, whether I'm playing for a big bash test match means the exact same thing to me. I'm doing what I can for my team. Uh, I've just learned that's the best way I enjoy playing cricket. It's the best what I get from myself. So I know those tours are important. There's people who have a lot of interest. India's ridiculously tough place to win i think it's going to be tougher than what it is for us in england just because of the conditions but for me i mean i'm big on my life is not dictated by how i play cricket that's not me as a person uh, my life is more more than cricket so as much as people may not want to hear that um, unfortunately that's just the truth so for me I'm just going to do my best for my team on those tours. If we win, we win. If we don't, what will be, will be. Um, and what was the second part of your question? Not getting sick in India, I reckon. <laughs> Deli belly. <laughs> um, yeah, that, 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 I'm, I'm just you're laughing, but that is kind of a thing. Yeah. You've got to be careful over there. I, I um, India in itself is a very tough place for us to tour because we can't really go out. We go out, we get mobbed, uh, we stay in a hotel room. When COVID happened, people were like, oh, COVID, like, you know, we can't leave. Our... But we've been doing this for 20 years. Every time we go to India, we can't leave our hotel rooms, really, because we can't go outside. So as cricketers, we were actually weren't too bad with it. So that's going to be, the, that's always the biggest challenge, just being in India, trying to do well in that environment. It can be really brutal, really different to us because we're used to going out, doing this and doing that. So it's everything around that will probably make it probably the toughest tour. More questions in the room. Do we want to go, do you want to maybe go online quickly? Do two online now, Dan. We're getting a fair few from online, which is great. So we'll see how many we get through. Uh, firstly, Usman, um, what was it like for you to score runs in Pakistan for Australia? Um, runs for Australia, great. Anyway, I guess it was more for my family, my dad, my mom, probably more my dad. He's, 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 my dad is like, okay, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> we immigrated to Australia in 1991 and my dad literally it was by luck he was driving past and he saw a big board billboard you know come to australia so my dad was like i am thinking about he was thinking about we were thinking about relocating he was thinking about relocating to the us like i'll just fill out i'll just go and have a look and they're like oh, i do this paperwork and my dad was like it was like a big paper he's like all right i'll do it fill in the paperwork send it back in not thinking much about it six months later they're like you've been accepted for the first one if you fill this out paperwork and you get accepted you got a working visa and you got a visa to come live permanently in australia filled out the visa again uh, got it back. You have, uh, you have, you've been accepted in Australia and come, you have the qualifications. My dad was an electrical engineer at the time, working for IBM. So I was like, come over. So my dad said to my mom, we're going over. Um, we're going to go. My mom lost it. She did not want to leave. <laughs> my mom had a pretty good life in Pakistan. She had a couple of servants. She was living like a quick, she was living like a real housewife in OC. She was, she had a pretty good life over there. So my mom didn't want to leave that. And eventually my dad's like, we'll just go for six months and go. And I always, I said to my dad, I'm like, dad, cause I do love the US. I've been in the US a lot. I love American sports. So part of me, yeah, part of me thinks maybe I could have made it in the US too or something else. Yeah. Baseball, probably not basketball because I'm vertically challenged, but maybe a baseball player. But anyway, I said, Dad, why did you pick Australia? He's like, cricket. I was like, excuse me? He's like, they don't play cricket in America. I was like, you're not, you're shitting me, right? He's like, no. He deadpan came to Australia because he loves cricket. And I'm like, this is a made up story. It's not true. My mom's, and I said to my mom that she's like, it's not a made up story. I'm like, what do you mean? You, 
came, he relocated. He liked Australia because they play cricket. It's like, yeah, he saw cricket. He came here in 1971 with an IBM tour and he watched cricket, like play in the park with the kids. And that really doesn't happen as much back because there's not much grass out there, but particularly in that time. Anyways, she's like, I promise you. I'm like, mom, you can't be serious. She's like, no, we got on the plane. We sat down the plane and it was us and my, and your dad was sitting there and he had a, you know, Australian going back to Australia, sitting there. And he started talking to him and he was like, oh, how are you doing? Yeah, you're from Australia. He's like, yeah, I'm from Sydney. My dad's like, yeah, we're, we're going over there for six months, Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, live over there. And the guy was like, okay, okay, awesome. The first question my dad asked, first question, do, do they play cricket in Australia still, don't they? And the guy was like, yeah, of course, they play cricket everywhere. And my dad was like, whoo, okay, good. Like, who does that? That was the first question he asked the fellow on the plane next to Australia. So, yeah, it's one of those things. Um, I don't even know. How did I get onto that conversation? What was the question? Yeah, when you that, scored runs in Pakistan. Yeah, so this is my dad, how much he loved cricket. So when I scored runs in Pakistan, when I scored runs in Karachi, all I thought about was my dad because – I just wanted him to give he, – he, there's no, been no greater support in my life than my parents and my dad, how much he loved cricket and what he sacrificed to come, those real housewife servants that he sacrificed, you know, helping my mom around, making life easier for her. Um, there was a lot of sacrifice to for us to have a better life in Australia. And he used to watch – um, cricket impact than Karachi he used to go down as a kid. He used to tell me about it. He used to watch Bob Simpson, Greg Chappell. And then for me to score a hundred up there and then to get on that honors board, when you score a hundred, you get on this big honors board. And I took a picture of him and I sent to him. Probably my mom said he had tears in his eyes because he was so excited that his son got to go and have his name on that honor board that he used to look up to and his kids. So it was, it was really special. Cricket when you were living in Pakistan? We left when I was four. Oh, okay. So not and really. I probably, I think we, we play out of the womb in Pakistan, so <laughs> probably. <laughs> Another question from online, speaking about parenthood, um, this question is about Usman the dad. Um, so just thinking of some of the experiences you've had and challenges in particular around inclusion, what's some of the advice you're giving to your daughters growing up in multicultural Australia? Is it getting better or is it getting harder? And also couldn't Pat Cummins given you one more over in Sydney? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he could have bloody Pat. Um, I think I've no, I've grown up males my whole life. I've had two older brothers. We had, I had a nephew. I never had girls in my whole life. So I, I honestly, this is a very new experience for me. Like when Aisha first came out and I like looked at her and then I started to be a bit rude. I saw a little vagina there. I was like, Oh my God, like, what do I do? What is going on here? And then I had to change the nappy first time. And I was like, just like, just like, you just uh, make sure my wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I don't want to hurt her. She's like, no, no, this is how you do it. I was like, well, no, be gentle, be gentle. Like I, the, all these new experiences in my life that I'd never, ever, I'd never been around. And then I laugh around my, my, my little daughter, Aisha, she is so funny. She's a little menace. I think she's got a bit of dad's, um, yeah personality not yet but she will be she's not far i reckon so she's a little menace like i'm she's just a little smart ass I'm, I'm changing her nappy and she's so funny now she purposely while i'm changing my nappy she's there she, i look at her face i'm like she's up to no good here and then she just left a big fart rip while i'm changing her nappy i'm like what are you doing woman i'm like you're a lady what are you like like as, in my life i've, I've always, as i said always been around men so to have that perspective of a girl and the way she jokes around and she's i was worried having girls i was like oh like I just, in my head, I always thought, oh, you got to have a boy, you know, I want him to play sport and I want him to do this and I want to do that. And when you have a girl, especially in today's day and age, they can do the exact same things. The girl, she can be a golfer. She can, I've already put golf stick, she's smacking her around. She can be a tennis player. She goes, dad, I tennis. I'm like, yeah, go, go play tennis and give a cricket back. I try to avoid cricket back because I don't want to watch, I don't want to spend the rest, next half of my life watching my daughter play cricket all day. So I keep putting golf sticks in her hand, but it was, it, that actually put in my head of how backward my own thinking was like, oh, I needed a boy to have a sportsman. And it's just not the case. And we're very lucky now that women can have careers being, you know, being sportsmen, have, uh, you know, the, the, the inclusivity that's happening now with women. And that's what you want. You want that fair and equitable, 
you know, you don't want that feeling of, oh, uh, you know, you, I've got a daughter, so she won't have as many choices in life. Life's going to be harder for her because life has been harder for women for such a long time. And I think that's why, especially as parents, as dads, we always, you know, at some level, especially the old school way of thinking, you always dreaded having a daughter for that reason. Um, Cause you felt like, well, unless she finds a good husband and marries her, like where's her life going to be? But that's not the case anymore. And, and that's what I love. That's the change I love seeing. And, and I love, you know, the way I joke around with my daughter, I don't treat my daughter any differently because she's a daughter. I treat her like what I would have treated my son. Like she falls over. I don't give my, my, the mother does. Rachel's a little softy. She's like, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just look at her. I'm just, she looks at me. I'm like, you're okay. Come on. And she just gets up and gets going again. So um, I, in my own self, I'm very conscious of not treating her any differently either, just because I really believe in that inclusivity and inequality now, especially since I've had to. And um, I guess the Brisbane Heat women's team is more successful than the Brisbane Heat men's team at the moment. We're all one team here, guys. We're all one team. We're, see, you stop trying to segregate us. We're all together in this. There's no, come on. <laughs> Uh, we've got time for just one last question in the room. If anyone's got a burning one down the front. We can go to if you want. If you've got a burning one, we can go to. Uh, thanks, Usman. Mine's all about mentality. Uh, you said at the beginning of this that you didn't enjoy your first couple of years in Cricket Australia when you made the men's team. Um, I think it's well documented. You being in and out, maybe not finding consistency, but also um, not really having like a sense of belonging in that team. Um, I feel like everybody in this room can at some point uh, empathize with that, um, whether it be like a social setting or maybe being a part of a team sport, but not necessarily feeling in with the click. Um, what was going through your head when you were having those inconsistencies? And what would you say to someone who is maybe struggling with that in a social setting and maybe in a team, anything like that? What would you say to them to try and, find that independence and really feel comfortable in their own skin and find solace in that. I mean, I think from my experience, whether you succeed or fail, you want to succeed your way. So I didn't feel like I was doing it my way when I first went in the Australian team. And I look back on those nine games I played, as I said, I was trying to fit in. I was trying to do all these different things. And then when I came back from that, I'm like, look, if I get an opportunity again, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail my way. And if I'm not going to succeed, if I don't achieve what my goals are, I'm going to do it my way. And I talked about how much, like, you know, I became a person. I was respectful. I got, you know, the thing was when people realized, like, even social scene, I don't go out with the boys anymore. Like, the guys always finish games. They drink. They go out. I just go back to my room. And they just accept that. That's what I did. They accept I don't like going out. I don't drink. Um, I'd rather just stay home and watch Netflix or, you know, just chill. That's, and for me, that was really important, but even more so important, I think to help that, I think, as I mentioned earlier, with your question earlier, the leaders are as important with that as anything, because we got some strange cats at Queensland cricket. I'm telling you, we got some strange, I won't name all of them, Manus, uh, <laughs> Joe Burns, um, we got some strange, I've actually put Matt Renshaw in there too. We got some strange people. And the one thing I love about, I say strange, but that's not the right word. They're very different, but I think that's what makes our team so special. Those different personalities are what makes us, is what makes us a good team. Because if you had everyone the same, everyone thinking the same way, I don't think you'd get the best out of yourself as a team. And I don't think um, you'd have ability to grow. So I think it's a little bit up to the leaders too, to really um to really encourage that to really encourage you know different personalities in a group um different ways people do things because i in my honest opinion um i was the different guy in australia when i first went in there and i know how it felt when i felt like i couldn't be myself and i couldn't contribute to the team so i was useless anyway so i guess two parts of that story one is the you have to accept that you know you if you want to succeed or fail you have to do it your way and you have to be true to yourself and the other part is the leadership part that the leaders whoever they are in that um, organization make you feel comfortable to be yourself and encourage that from you because if you don't have their support like i felt like i didn't have the support um, from the leaders when i first got on the australian cricket team it's very hard for you to succeed 
Nice. Vicky, last question. Thank you, Osman. Um, it's amazing. Thanks very much. And being so honest and uh, genuine around, you talked earlier about wanting to sort of change the establishment of Australian cricket and being an influencer. I'm, I'm wondering if you're thinking your next career move might be to get into the establishment around leadership or maybe the next CEO of Australian cricket to the future, because we've got a genuine inclusive CEO that probably could mentor you <laughs> on that journey. Have you thought about that? Uh, yes. yes and no. Uh, Look, I love cricket, and when I was younger, I thought, oh, no, no I'm, I, I've got a Bachelor of Aviation degree. I, I, I got that when I was 21, became a fully qualified commercial pilot, got my air transport pilot license then. So that was a backup plan for me. Cricket didn't work out, and then the longer I've been in the game, I have thought, no, nah, I don't want to go and fly planes after I finish because I've travelled way too much as it is. Um, so I'm sick of travelling. I hate that, but that's my most hated part of the game. But I... I have thought about it in some respect, but I think after the game, I like to be involved in the game in bits and pieces and be able to spend time as much as I can with my family. Um, be fortunate enough, I've played cricket for a long time. Um, so I probably would have the opportunity to spend a little bit more time with my family once it's over because, you know, yeah, God knows I've, I've been away a lot, both from my mom and dad and from Rachel and the kids. So that's probably first and foremost. But um, I am doing an MBA at the moment. Um, Chipping away, chip, like literally chipping one subject a semester, chipping away at it. Um, and that's only because, not because I necessarily want to become CEO of Cricket Australia or anything like that, but I'd like to have, I'd like to have something behind my back in case that opportunity ever did turn up. I wouldn't take that opportunity and I probably wouldn't get that opportunity straight away anyway, but I wouldn't want to do that straight away. I think I still want to be involved in the game, do a little bit of commentary, just chill, play a little bit of golf, have some fun, have some woozy time. Um, but definitely in the future, I think that could be somewhere um, where I'd head towards. I just don't know. You never know in life what can happen. As I said, I like to stay in the moment. Um, yeah, it could be something. That or the Prime Minister of Australia, I don't know. <laughs> King Uzi, King Uzi, move over That's Charles. the Prime Minister's name, <laughs> King Uzi. <laughs> I've got super quick, four quick questions. I've Best bowler question. you've ever faced. Uh, uh, Kagita Rabada mm -hmm. from South Africa. Wow. Um, best, most memorable player? Um, oh, I, my two favourite were Brian Lara and Adam Gilchrist. So them two, both left-handers. Best crowd of recent times? Uh, definitely when I came back into the team last year um, at SCG and scored those two hundreds, I had Uzi chant going on, Uzi chant for about five minutes. I got 100 just before the tea break, you know, they were chanting my name as I went off. I went in, uh, got a little banana, came back out, and they were still chanting Uzi. It was unbelievable. That's, that's something I'll never forget. And finally, your best moment that you're most proud of in cricket. Oh, that's a tough, <laughs> um, Receiving my baggy green cap, I think. Uh, my, my family was in the stands. They saw it. Uh, it was a pretty special moment. You dream your whole life to play for Australia. You think you're going to get there, and then most times you never think you're actually going to get there. So to actually achieve it, uh, honestly, can't explain. You wait 15 years, 20 years to achieve it. So, yeah, it means a lot. Awesome. Thank you very much. We might wrap it there, just conscious that we don't have a lot of time and we, I'm sure there's still a few people that want to get their chests signed. Um, <laughs> I just you wanted make to, that sound so I'm stupid. <laughs> T-shirt for those online. Um, I just want to do another quick plug for Learning Week. Um, starts in two weeks' time on Monday the 30th. Head to Talent Lab. Um, we'd love to see you. If you love this session, no doubt you'll love to see um, Ashley Noffy and um, Georgia Redmayne. Um, they're going to be sharing some insights on how they've dealt with successes and setbacks as well. And um, they're from the WBBL Heat team as well. So jump online for that. Um, quick thank yous. Um, thank you to Dan Cosgrove for all your time and effort in bringing this together and Linda um, to Darcy um, and Hugh Beck and um, uh, Adam from the Queensland Cricket and Corp Services for helping us set up the room today. Thank you all for giving up your time today to come in and hear from Usman and of course 
Thank you so much. I know you're a very busy man. You've got three games left. And what is it? We've got to win two At least two, to get yeah. into the finals. Yeah. So I think half of this room will probably be there. I think this man here has been to every single game. <laughs> we're very passionate. We give out jerseys to everyone in the office to wear. So we're very passionate Brisbane Heat fans. So all the very best. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. Enjoyable. Well, and of applause. Well done to her too. Great. Great work. Great work. <laughs> So for those in the room, if you want to come over here and just line up, if you've got anything, I think we've got about 10 minutes and then he's got to head back to the team. So, um, yeah, feel free to come up here and do some signing.